I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for October 10, 2017. I invite you to rise and recite the <coughs> Pledge of Allegiance to the flag uh, to be led by Neverson Sim Clark, a CCBC student, but more importantly, a former <coughs> Western Tech student. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mrs. White, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? Mr. Chair, there are no changes or additions. All right, hearing none, is there a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Second? Second. second. There's a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Very good. We'll proceed with the agenda as prepared. Sign-up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this <coughs> evening's meeting. Uh, board practice limits to 10, the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. The completed sign-up cards for this evening have been placed uh, in the box to my right, and the first 10 drawn from the box by uh, Ms. Schaefer will be our speakers for tonight's um, um, public comment portion of the meeting. Of course, if fewer than 10 have signed up, all will speak. Thank you, Ms. Schaefer. <laughs> uh, Patrick Roddy. Oh, Jesus, is a fix. Diana Bergman. Robert Hartlove, Jr. Dr. Bosch Ferrone. Eric Edwards. Sharon Suroff. Mohammed Jamiz. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Um, as everyone knows, uh, this evening we'll also have comments from those individuals who have uh, signed up to speak about the proposed school calendar for 2018-2019 and the school climate, school behavior, and discipline. Uh, each speaker in, uh, has signed up for that will uh, be heard, and each will be allowed three minutes to address the board. The board's also pleased that elected officials are here this evening, and there are four elected officials who have indicated a, a desire to speak to the board this evening. I'm going to call them first before we call the um, uh, advisory and stakeholder groups. Uh, so uh, first, and uh, I'll ask all of the elected officials, um, Speakers have uh, three minutes to the extent that you can hold it below three minutes. That's great as well. We have a, a busy uh, docket this evening. First, I ask uh, Senator Bobby Zirkin to come forward. <coughs> Senator, welcome. Ladies and gentlemen of the board, I, first of all, I apologize about my outfit. I was just with my daughters at school, so I apologize. Um, and thank you for listening to me just for a few minutes, but it, I would be remiss if I didn't say it's really nice to see Josie Schaefer here. Yeah. Uh, I spent the day at her school today, so um, <laughs> it's great to see you in your position. Um, I really just wanted to speak briefly about the proposal uh, related to Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the two highest uh, holidays of the Jewish faith. Um, you know, you, uh, yeah, I'm sure we all, you know, Facebook and social media and emails and so forth. I could, we could cure the criminal justice system, and you would get a certain number of emails. But you take away, you make people go to school on the high holidays. I must have gotten a thousand emails on this thing from my constituents, and so I came here both personally and also as a representative of, the, of District 11. Um, I mean, scores of individuals, teachers, not just those that are going to school in my district, but the kids, the parents but also teachers, substitute teachers, and so forth that would be affected by this. 
I don't want to get into your, the, deep, the weeds of, uh, of your school calendar, uh, and I'm loath to come here to speak, but I, I would be remiss if I didn't say I think this is a very, very bad idea. Um, and I'm a product of Baltimore County Public Schools. We started after Labor Day. We were off on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and we made it work. Um, and I know you can make it work as well. I would ask you, I, I had heard or at least saw in the news that, that a committee had made that recommendation, and I would ask that you very strongly consider not uh, accepting that recommendation and continue with what we've been doing for many years. And that is all I have to say, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Thank you so much. for. Uh, uh, next, I invite Delegate Robin Grammer to come forward. Thank you. I am a politician, but I think I can keep it below three minutes. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate the opportunity to talk here tonight. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Robin Grammer. I am uh, one of several state delegates that represent southeastern Baltimore County. That's Dundalk, Essex, Edgemere. I'm here tonight because I'm receiving continuous complaints from parents, students, and other concerned citizens regarding discipline or the lack of discipline in Baltimore County public schools. This is in terms of both specific cases that are going unresolved over long periods of time and general climate issues regarding violence, abuse, bullying at our local schools, which are only seeming to get worse. The feeling I'm getting from parents and teachers is that they're completely terrified uh, about talking about these issues uh, for fear of retribution for their job or retribution for their student. And in, in response to what are some really radical stories that I'm hearing regarding cases of bullying and disciplinary policies at our local schools, when I talk to someone from Baltimore County, the response and the feeling that I get is, well, we don't see any problems and that everything's working okay. This is a major and massive disconnect between parents and teachers and Baltimore County. And my ultimate hope tonight is that there are a handful of parents who are brave enough tonight to come and tell their stories about their families, their sons and daughters, about how disciplinary policies at Baltimore County Public Schools are impacting the education of their children. Uh, and I'll leave it at that, and I appreciate the opportunity for myself and our parents to come and speak tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Delegate. <coughs> uh, also here tonight, I invite uh, to come forward Delegate Bob Long. Good evening, thank you for this opportunity. I'm Delegate Bob Long from the 6th District. Um, we're talking about discipline. It's a big thing that we need to address. Uh, one of the things we go, we look at restorative practices. Uh, we need to look into that. Also, our, I uh, heard on TV today that a, one uh, jurisdiction in New York actually just passed legislation that if you continue bullying at, one, at the last point that the parents will be fined and or jailed. I think that we need to look into every avenue that we can because discipline is a problem in, in a lot of our schools. I think we have to be decisive. We have to have clear and, you know, rules. And I think that's one of the problems that we're not, we, we have. That's my personal opinion. But I thought that was amazing that uh, this one school district said, if your process, go through the process, if you're convict, you know, whatever the process is for bullying, your parents are held accountable. You have to pay a fine and could possibly go to jail. I know we, and we were talking about restorative practices. One of the things I was talking to one of the gentlemen out in the hall, tardiness is a problem. When my kids went to school, if they were tardy, after so many times, they had to go in on Saturdays. And guess what? The parents had to pay for the proctor. I think we need to start looking outside the box and making sure that we have this, you know, have the right discipline and, uh, and clear, just to make sure that these kids are quite clear. Uh, respect is one of the things we, we're lacking in our schools, that's for sure. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate. Uh, last but not least here this evening is Councilman Todd Crandall. Councilman. 
Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> Thank you for uh, recognizing me back in the in the back there, Ed. I did not sign up to speak, so I do Ooh. appreciate so. Um, the only thing is when you're you when don't you're, have to use all three minutes. When you're unprepared, you tend to go on longer, right? <laughs> so I'm going to uh, see if I can uh, address that. So um, I, I concur with uh, my two delegates, Delegate Long and, and Delegate Grammer. Um, we have uh, received numerous complaints from parents um, uh, and it, uh, regarding discipline in our schools, all of the issues that um, uh, both the delegates uh, have already brought up. Um, it is something that um, we have asked the school board to address. One suggestion that I uh, will bring to the table tonight is uh, um, uh, we have, I, I believe, two parents that want to talk to the board tonight, but there are a lot more parents that I think would like to uh, voice their concerns to the board or members of the board. I think it's difficult for people in our district um, to get to Towson at 6.30 on a Tuesday evening. So my request would be that the board consider sending a representative, uh, perhaps the superintendent could send a representative to, uh, to talk to some of these parents and hear their stories and their, their anecdotes. Um, and, uh, and, and hopefully that will trigger some of the work that, um, uh, Verlita, I think that you, you've already begun. So I think um, the fact that you are addressing these issues, um, and I know you're very new, um, and these things take a little bit of time, but if, um, uh, if, if our communities are more informed as to where we might be headed with this issue, um, that would serve our constituencies uh, very well. So thank you again for having me and for recognizing me. Thank you, Councilman. Um, so next on our uh, agenda is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. Uh, the members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. Uh, while we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of the board, uh, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. <laughs> uh, I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks uh, and other behavior that disrupts or interferes is out of order. I ask you all as well uh, to observe the three minute clock which will let you know when your time is up. We'll first have the advisory and stakeholder groups uh, speak and our first speaker on that list is TABCO's representative Abby Baton. Ms. Baton. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Superintendent White, and members of the board. We have several important topics to discuss tonight, and on this time, I'm going to speak at the next two is also, but this time I'm going to focus my remarks on discipline. We continue to work with BCPS officials and are in the process of scheduling meetings to delve even further into discipline issues. We are training faculty councils and administrators specifically on discipline plans. The joint work group with BCPS will be bringing recommendations and suggestions for system-wide changes and supports for discipline work throughout BCPS. The one thing we don't want to have happen is for this board to adopt a prescriptive policy with specifics that are better placed in a behavior handbook. The board policy should be overarching and discuss behavior issues and concerns, but it should not contain specific absolute punishments. We want to see a policy that is both smart and full of empathy. As far as restorative practices go, we are excited about its transformative potential. TABCO educators are advocating to ensure we engage with the new, this new approach effectively with our eyes open and with enough resources and training to make it work. We don't want educators with insufficient training attempting these subtle approaches to then find them lacking and becoming less willing to try them again in the future. Please continue to work with us to take full advantage of the opportunity that restorative practices presents us as a system. We look for forward to further collaboration on the critical issue of discipline as well as, well as other important topics. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Baton. Our next speaker from the Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee is Megan Stewart Sicking. Chairman Gillis, Ms. White, members of the board, good evening to all of you. 
Over the next several board meetings, members of the CCAC Executive Board will be here to discuss specific items in the next budget for the Office of Special Ed. Tonight, there are several other issues I'd like to discuss. First, October is Dyslexia Awareness Month. As you know, there are special education teachers participating in the Orton-Gillingham Professional Learning Series, and we would like to thank them for their commitment. We understand it requires teachers to be released from their buildings during this very comprehensive series, so we also want to thank the administrators who are supporting their teachers and supporting this instruction in their schools. Next, I want to draw attention to the contract modification on tonight's board agenda for assistive technology software. Kurzweil 3000 is an important tool for teachers in the classroom and for compliance with IEPs. It can also be a game changer for students. It has benefits ranging from allowing text to be read to students to increasing their ability to answer high-level comprehension, comprehension questions. Perhaps most importantly to us, in our view, it increases student confidence and creates opportunities for success that helps solidify foundations in literacy. We urge the board to modify this contract as requested. And finally, I want to note that our executive board has met in person with Kenny West, Assi Assistant Director of Transportation, and Terrence Powell, who oversees special needs transportation specifically. We were updated on the multi-year strategic plan with the Office of Special Ed and their work on issues such as collaboration, professional development, route analysis, driver recruitment, and retention. We understand that there are still things that need work, and transportation certainly knows this as well. Transportation has had problems, especially with special ed children and parents, in the past. However, the reporting and discussion earlier this year missed the fact that some significant improvements have been made. Our executive board agrees that one area where we have seen great improvement is in responsiveness from the current staff, and I've heard this from some parents as well. Transportation has reached out to CCAC leadership proactively and allowed plenty of time for our questions. We also understand that they are in the process of implementing new software that will track correspondence and responsiveness. We will continue to follow these transportation issues closely throughout the year, but would like to acknowledge that we appreciate transportation's current work with us and with the Office of Special Ed at this time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker from the PTA Council of Baltimore County is Jane Lee. I'm kind of getting used to this. <laughs> Good evening, Superintendent White, Chairman Gillis, and board members. I usually come and talk about the emails and calls that I've received in the last two weeks. I'm glad to see that I have some parents coming to speak for themselves, but I will go into the issues that you were going to discuss. First, the behavior problems and social climate are always important to us at PTA, from restraints to bullying. We do have concerns that one factor may be that interpersonal relationships suffer because our children are spending so much time on devices and not enough learning social skills that it leads to behavior problems. The fact that we have water problems in schools and heat problems in schools also leads to behavior problems. And then there's the problem with the transportation, which starts off the day poorly and can also lead to the behavior problems. So all the other complaints tie into our behavior problem. As to the calendar, I told you how many emails I was getting. I can't even count them anymore when it came to the calendar. And they were overwhelmingly in support of your option B, which is closing on the holidays of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. The reason for that is safety. The fact that, and don't going conservative, using 10% of teachers being Jewish, not the 15 that I heard last time, you would have 1,500 adults missing from buildings. If you could cover for all of them, and that is doubtful, you will not necessarily have trained professionals in those buildings to watch after the children, and should there be an emergency, we have great concern for their safety. 
Next, I would ask that the PTA Council have a meeting with the board just as the advisory council did tonight because we are the parent advocacy group of record in the county and would like to discuss some of these things one-on-one -on -one with you and not publicly because we want to work together. And that's it for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is from the Educational Support Professionals of Baltimore County. That's Lila Marin Bloom. Good evening. Good evening. Superintendent White, Chairman Gillis, and Board of Education. It took a long time for Baltimore County to finally close schools on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Baltimore County, just like any other employer and service provider, wants teachers and staff on the job and their students in school. However, there are some days that keeping schools open isn't worth the added expense since there is no real learning going on due to a predictable higher than usual staff and student absenteeism rate. It is estimated that it will cost the system an additional million dollars more in substitute salaries alone to keep schools open just for these two days. Will our students benefit from this expenditure? Will our students be getting quality instruction or midday babysitting with the opportunity to be part of an anonymous misbehaving group? There are not enough substitutes during the year to provide knowledgeable, adequate coverage for classrooms and offices when teachers and staff are out due to illness or pressing personal business. What happens when substitutes can't be located to fill in on a regular workday? Risky quality, risking quality, many schools and offices redistribute workloads among the staffers present. Teachers are routinely asked to fill in for fellow teachers that are not at work. When a teacher with a free period can't be located, then paraeducators become the fallback substitute. Paraeducators are not just asked to cover classes for absent teachers, but other absent paraeducators or absent additional adult assistants in conjunction with completing their regularly assigned duties. Some of our paraeducators will also be absent on those two days. If enough substitutes cannot be located to fill in for the absent teachers, who will be asked to fill in for absent classroom office and paraeducators? When the only objective is to have an adult to supervise the class, who will there be to help teachers and substitutes deal with less than cooperative students in the classroom? I am here to ask you to continue to keep schools open during Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is from the Citizens Advisory Committee for Gifted and Talented Education. That's Julie Miller Britz. <laughs> Good evening, Chairman Gillis, board members, Ms. White, and the BCPS community. At the last several Board of Education meetings, I have shared some numbers with you all in order to help illuminate the true need for increased academic office. I have outlined how the advanced academic office staff has been significantly reduced over the last decade, and I have compared BCPS's resources devoted to students receiving advanced academic services to other surrounding school districts, finding that BCPS is rather drastically behind Montgomery, Anne Arundel, Frederick, and Howard County in terms of staffing. This week, I would like to focus on staffing levels for several offices within Baltimore County Public Schools that serve special populations of students. The Office of Career and Technology serves 45,739 students and has a staff of 14 for a ratio of one staff person to 3,267 students. The Special Education Office serves 13,121 students and has a staff of 66 for a ratio of one staff person to 199 children. The ESL office serves 5,047 children with a staff of 14 for a ratio of one staff person to 360 students. 
the advanced academic office is more complicated. Because of the fluid and flexible nature of advanced academic programs in elementary school, there is no number of how many children are accessing these services in grades K through five. However, there are 26,972 AA students in grades six through 12. If we estimate that there are approximately 13,000 K-5 students, which is likely a low estimate, then the total number of students might be around 40,000 served by a staff of six. This works out to a ratio of one staff person to 6,667 children. What BCPS needs is development and implementation of AA programs that emphasize interaction with peers and teachers, which can't happen without more staff. We have heard from many parents who voice very real concerns about the instruction their GT child is receiving. We have heard repeatedly about students in advanced academics who seem to be getting instruction via personalized learning software at a higher degree than others in the class, thereby losing opportunities for face-to-face -face instruction with the teacher, time for socialization, and time with their peer group. Additionally, if a student is erroneously placed into the wrong level on one of these programs, the teacher is not able to override the software, meaning that the student has to work through levels they have already learned. This algorithmic learning, which can be formulaic and sterilized, strips the teacher their skills, knowledge, and responsibilities. And there are many teachers who have not received much, if any, formalized training on teaching GT students. We believe that increasing staffing in the AA office would afford many opportunities, including increased opportunities for professional development and training, more capacity for AA staff to write and revise curricula across content areas, as well as help AA staff better work with the advanced academic facilitators that are already in schools. Most of all, though, it would give these students what they need and what they deserve. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is from uh, Ask Me, and that's Michael Fahey. Good evening, uh, uh, Good Chairman evening. Gillis and um, Superintendent White and members of the board. Um, I represent over 3,000 employees. Uh, f more than 1,500 of those are 10-month employees, and half of those are part-time employees. Uh, we do not work or get paid on um, teacher um, professional development days. Um, we get two inclement weather days, so if, if there's more than two days that we're closed, the schools are closed, we don't get paid for those days. And it's for that reason that I support the, the committee's recommendation of option A, because those would be two extra days that we wouldn't get paid for, that our checks would be short. Um, as far as the discipline issue, um, i just go back, to, we have serious problems with discipline on the school buses, and i just go back to what I asked two weeks ago, that we need an audit of the uh, Transportation Department. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, time for public comment speakers, and the first of those is Patrick Roddy. Mr. Roddy. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Superintendent White, Thank you very much for allowing me to speak today on behalf of three of my clients, St. Vincent de Paul, no Kid, Maryland No Kid Hungry, and Maryland Hunger Solutions. These three organizations are committed to expanding child nutrition opportunities throughout Maryland and have been particularly focused over the last few months in expanding after-school meals for students in Baltimore County. As board members, you know the numbers. There are 52,000 Baltimore County students who are eligible under the federal guidelines for free and reduced price lunches, free and reduced price meals. These meals include after school meals, but unfortunately, Baltimore County lags in this area and in fact is one of the lowest, has one of the lowest participation rates for after school meals of any jurisdiction in Maryland. Um, as you know also, these meals are paid for through federal government funds and are available to a number of sponsoring organizations, including the three organizations that I represent here tonight. Those three organizations are already partnering with the school board to bring the, with, excuse me, the Baltimore County Public Schools to bring these kinds of meals to the children who need them the most. 
because otherwise it is very possible that children in these kinds of situations may not be able to provide dinner for themselves or have their parents provide it for them. In order for you to be better educated about the ease of this service and how it works currently, we have sent to each of you an invitation to visit an on-site feeding site in the next few, in, in the next few days. Uh, we hope you could avail yourself of that. It's going to be a short visit, and we hope that you will see exactly how beneficial and easy the service of these warm after-school meals are in the uh, Police Athletic League uh, centers that we have arranged the tours for. Uh, members of the organizations I represent will be there as hosts and will also uh, be there to uh, introduce you to the PAL Center staff. Um, we do want to congratulate this board and the school system in their aggressive uh, policies in the area of breakfast and lunch. We think that that is good and, and should be uh, continued. Uh, we, are, we do understand also that, this, that the school system has recently made after school meals available to any school that requests it. This is something else also that should be applauded. We are concerned, however, that there is about the level of awareness of that offering. And we would ask the board to make sure that they um, have the staff talk to them about the participation in after school meals and how many schools have actually asked to have after school meals provided for their after school <coughs> programs in their particular locations. Um, thank you, Mr. Roddy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Good to see you again. Great, thank you. Uh, um, our next speaker is Diana Bergman. Everybody. Um, I brought water today, that's why I ran out to go get it. So all these waters represent the 24 schools in BCPS that parents have concern about the quality of water at their sites. Now some of these parents were going to send me their water samples to my home and I didn't want that coming to my home. So I got a little creative and I said, okay, let me show a visual, show and tell like we did in school. This water is clean and is fresh, and each one of them has a school on there, like Colgate Elementary, Sandalwood. Well, I got here early to talk to Mr. Um, Kevin Smith and Mr. Dickerson, which was awesome because they were able to explain to me the process of how our water gets tested in BCPS. Some of the water in our school buildings are coming in um, through the county water line, and some sites are through the wells. But the color and the quality water, parents are questioning, they don't know. So I asked both of them if they could test the 24 sites um, to reassure these parents um, the, the quality of their water. And then they explained to me that we need every single parent that messaged me on social media, reach out to your principals, please. They submit the request per site. If you have a shortage in your water coolers that are available at these sites, they could add water coolers with the reasonable request of why they need it. Um, but it shows something that's very important. Tonight, later on, we'll be talking about discipline and what our children put into their bodies plays a factor in their behavior and the school climate. Okay, we need to have children that have nutritional meals, not just any snack, but nutritional meals and safe quality water for them to drink. So if you're thirsty throughout the meeting, because I understand it's gonna be a long one today, just pick up one of the free waters in our basket. And I've also shared the 24 list of schools with my board member representative so he knows what they are and also with Mr. Dickerson. He was very nice. I like talking to him. So I think it's very important for everybody to communicate with each other. Communication is key for all of us to move forward and not get stuck. So thank you and good night. Thank you. Our next speaker is Robert Hartlove Jr.
How are you? Thank you for your time. Good evening. Uh, my name is Robert Hartloff. I'm an eight-year Marine veteran, so discipline doesn't come far from us. Uh, we had some issues at Sparrows Point Middle School last year. Um, we had an issue with a child that was being coddled by a principal. Now, this child has been reported with multiple assault charges within Baltimore County public school property. Um, this principal decided to put him in a separate room. This child left the room, wandered the halls. Uh, so I immediately wrote a social media post about it, and I wasn't getting a response back from the principal. Um, after my social media post went to all the local areas, I had over 100 posts and messages back, 12 including Sparrows Point Middle School teachers. These teachers have told me that this child threw soda cans at their head, uh, drawing profanity on desks. There's nothing they can do about it, they're being told. Uh, this child, from a parent's, the girl was walking to the bathroom, and this child told her he was going to rape her. Uh, two girls from another parent were walking home from school, and this child pulled out a knife and tried to steal stuff out of their book bag. And this child had multiple SART charges, multiple suspensions, and was still allowed to stay in Baltimore County School. Now, at some point, I understand that you have to try to mold a child and try to help them if they don't have the same upbringing as others. But at some point, too, you have to figure out of how much safety to the other children are you going to allow that to. This child has left the classroom, this is building, and he went into a classroom with kids learning, and this child walked up and started punching a kid. The dad was a Baltimore City cop and filed charges against him. This is happening in your school system. So I want you all to ask yourself, if you had a child, son or daughter, do you think that's OK for your daughter to get told she's going to get raped going to the bathroom? Or do you think it's OK for your son to get randomly punched, not doing anything? This stuff is happening in your school system. Do you think it's OK if, you're, if your family member is a teacher and they're getting assaulted at school? This is not OK. So if you think this is OK, and this is happening in your school system, there is a disconnect, as Mr. Grammer said. So I appreciate your time, and I hope this gets solved. So thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Bosch Ferron. Senator Zirkin mentioned 1,000 emails. Last year, we brought you 800 to 900 petition of Muslim Americans residing in the county, and we gave it to you, all right? That was not really taken in consideration. When Ms. Romaine Williams asked for the input of the public about the calendar and the holidays, especially non-Komar holidays. This room was filled with Muslim Americans residing in this county and the whole world. That was not taken into consideration. If it is numbers game, a thousand Jewish emails should be equal to a thousand Muslim who came here, and actually more than a thousand. Other assertion is that it's unsafe to open on the Jewish holidays. There's really no proof of that. In the last calendar committee, all members, including Mr. Duke and Mr. Burke behind me, agreed that there are no data that have been used credibly to close on the Jewish holiday. It basically started with Dr. Berger. He closed on his own holiday, and everybody after that really followed through. High cost of substitutes. It's about equality. If the school system has to get substitutes for any reason, it's about equality. Jews paying taxes equal Muslims paying taxes. Hindus paying taxes. Sikhs paying taxes. It's about equality. Absenteeism. It's a fake sham statistic. You can't use absenteeism as Mr. Olfelder has proposed that a couple of years ago. It means the person wants to take off. It doesn't mean the person is really Jewish. Could be a friend of a Jewish person. Could be somebody who is not really even has a faith. He just really wants to take the school system and have another day or two 
as school closing days. Discipline, you heard that today a whole lot. How about discipline of the Board of Education in granting non comar religious holiday closure based on secular, objective, verifiable reason and not really a political reason? Watch all the Muslim Americans who came since 2004. Actually, I have been here since 1997 or so. All of them are ordinary citizens. What does the lobby bring in? It brings Senator Durkin and the BJC director, which is a political organization. Thank you, Dr. Fran. Our next speaker is Eric Edwards. Superintendent White, board members, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak. In. And um, the uh, Marine, I believe it was Mr. Hartlow, and they mentioned about the uh, discipline and our children. And I, I second the aspect of, of us looking at it as our children um, and, and not just looking at it as an issue. Several of our delegates and, and, and parents and, uh, um, have really discussed the items regarding various proposals of what to do and how to really address these disciplinary issues. However, the challenges you know, may not be just that. The focus should also be, and really even more so, focusing on the cause of this as far as why. The state and the county has guidelines where there's mental, where there's actually vision and hearing screening that's mandated, but mental health screening is not something that's listed as part of that, that mandate. And that's something that we should really be addressing. Um, that was a young lady said earlier with regard to more. She touched on the why as far as uh, situations regarding the busing, uh, as far as heat and air conditioning. I've been to several meetings where there have been, you know, you know we, we still have schools that don't have adequate air conditioning. We have a, a school that I represent, Western Tech which go Wolverines, um, as awesome as that school is, and as many schools are in Baltimore County Public Schools, um, has been around for 20-something years and has not had a renovation. Now, that's not to say that there haven't been air conditioning put in. Some pieces, there are um, window units in several schools as opposed to having adequate air conditioning for the entire community, which many of those things could affect. But I think really, coming back to my initial point regarding the mental, you know, mental health screenings with the exposure to so many forms of media, whether it be video games, movies, uh, and you know, the social media as far as the internet. The information age has brought so much more into lives. Families have become more busy with regard to the, the, the workload, the student workload for when you and I were in school is three times as greater than, you know, for, for our children. And when I say our children, I mean our children in BCPS. And I don't know if any of your children are in Baltimore City, you know, Baltimore County Public Schools. I'm a representative, you know, I actually grew up in Baltimore City. So I'm a product of Baltimore City Public Schools. And, you know, my mom and dad did the best they could. But I was a latchkey kid. I would venture to say that there still are latchkey kids that are out there. And they may be dealing with a lot more issues than what we've ever even addressed. So just, you know, looking at laws and regulations, that's one aspect, but we need to really step back and maybe talk to the kids and really find out what's going on in their heads and really see if we can get to that cause and maybe point. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sharon Saroff. Good evening. I hope you're not getting sick of me yet. Good evening. Maybe if we start doing our jobs, I won't be here. I'm going to talk again about communication, and this time concerning the communication that is delivered by school administrators to parents and their representatives. I have had so many complaints from parents this school year that I haven't had even time to rest on my Jewish holidays. 
because I'm getting inundated with phone calls. Parents who are telling me that their teachers are not implementing IEPs and principals who are telling me about non-existent documents that they don't even know what it is. I have one principal telling me, oh, there's an RTI document. How many of you on the board know what an RTI document is? RTI stands for Response to Intervention. When I went to a special ed meeting for that particular student, the IEP chair and the case manager didn't even know that the RTI document existed because there isn't an RTI document for that student. This is the kind of lack of communication or poor communication that goes on between administrators and parents because of the administrators not understanding the law and not willing to address parent needs and student needs. And if you're not addressing student needs in special ed, you have discipline problems. And I'm gonna talk about that later on public comment for that particular issue. But I have students whose parents are very concerned that IEPs aren't being implemented the way they should be, because I equals individual, not one size fits all. We can't continue to dump kids in general education and not address their needs and not allow parents to be involved we can't continue to intimidate them or the representatives or retaliate against them. And when I speak of retaliation, I personally have felt that because of my own children in the Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Muhammad Jamil. Peace and good evening, Chair, Mr. Gillis, and Ms. White, and the esteemed members of the board. I am Mohammed Jamil as an ex-Naval officer, an educator, past PTA president, businessman, member of the FBI Citizens Academy, one of the commissioners in one of the commissions, and represented nearly 30,000 Muslims of the greater Baltimore as president of the Islamic Society of Baltimore. Today, I sit here before you for the 78th time as an ordinary citizen. In other words, I didn't get off the boat yesterday. I am well aware of the politics and the challenges that are entrenched in our system. As a PTA president during Dr. Dubell's time, that goes to tell you what old I am, I observed firsthand the discriminatory policies and unequal distribution of resources across the schools. Later, we also discovered the Islamophobic curriculum full of misinformation or disinformation in use since decades in the BCPS for the seventh and 10th grades. We were consistently reminded that this was a scholarly written curriculum until the curriculum audit in 2008 rectified the erroneous information. We couldn't get our arms around such phenomena and the, and the institutionalization of Islamophobia until this is what I discovered. This is George Curzon, the British Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs from 1911 to 1921. He sent this advisory to President Woodrow Wilson. And here it is. We must put an end to anything which brings about any Islamic unity between the sons of the Muslims as we have already succeeded in finishing off them. So we must ensure that there will never ever arise again unity for the Muslims, whether it be intellectual or cultural unity. Well, knowing that this is the root cause, 
we have been investigating and been on the mission to educate. It's your job in the board to educate the citizenry so that they are enlightened, so that they understand what is the true fact. We have right now 917 hate groups in addition to the crime syndicates in our country. And every year the numbers is increasing. They comprise of religious as well as different ethnic groups. It should alarm us if we are truly patriotic and love our country. Not a single one of these is of Islamic background. We have rebutted every one of your alternative facts to justify injustice and denial of equal treatment to Muslim students. We are only for Islamic background. Islamic background should be rebutted. Thank you. 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 Thank uh, next on our agenda is public comment on proposed school 2018-2019 <laughs> calendar. And the first person who has signed up to speak is Howard Libet. Thank you, members of the board. My name is Howard Libet. I'm the executive director of the Baltimore Jewish Council and also the proud parent of two children here in the Baltimore County Schools. Uh, you've heard me speak before on this issue, so I'll try and keep it short. I want to thank Senator Zirkin, thank the PTA Council, and, and thank the educators of Baltimore County who agree that the, the best calendar choice for next year would be the one that keeps the county schools closed for the two Jewish holidays. I know this isn't about respecting a particular religion. The, the children and the teachers and the principals and the staff who are Jewish will observe the Jewish holidays next year, regardless of whether the schools are closed. The question is the impact of what happens to the schools if they're kept open next year. The number of subs that would be needed for the large number of Jewish teachers and other staff, whether you could find those subs, and if you can, what the cost would be, and what the learning is. We've heard the stories of to, uh, from teachers and others who were in the schools back in the, before the mid-1990s when the schools were open on the Jewish holidays. There wasn't enough staffing. It was a struggle to find subs. You had many classrooms without enough supervision. So kids were put in auditoriums so that there'd be enough staff to watch them. That's not learning. There's a cost to that as well. Again, I know you can't make a decision based on religion. This is based solely on operational and fiscal needs. I've shared with a number of you the best data we have, it's not precise. There's no, form, there's no box on the form to apply to be a teacher that says, I'm Jewish. Nor is there a box on the form when you enroll your children in the public schools to list what religion you are. So the data is not perfect, but the best data we have available suggests there are significant numbers of Jewish students, teachers, principals, and staff who would be taking the holiday, holidays off and would have a substantial impact on the operation of the county schools. Either way, we don't have spring break back. It's still a short weekend, regardless of whether, or excuse me, a long weekend, regardless of which calendar option you pick. Both calendar options have five inclement weather days. There, there's protection in there for weather. We're still stuck with either a four or five day weekend. I urge you to make the best operational decision for the county schools and keep them closed on the Jewish holidays next year. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Diana Bergman. Um, uh, 2018 2019 calendar okay this is the calendar okay perfect um, hi everybody so as you know my husband's active duty military and we've had the opportunity to see how each school district in different states do their calendar one thing I noticed last year with the change of starting school after Labor Day and ending school on June 15 was that last year the calendar committee had three options to choose from. This year I'm kind of curious that there's only two. And um, 
there's one piece that really bothers me, I take very personal, and I know it's more of a state issue, but Veterans Day here in the state of Maryland is not off in public school. And that really bothers me, because my husband received and was named after a veteran. I have two very close friends of mine that paid the ultimate price that were veterans. So on Veterans Day for my military family, we would like to take the opportunity of visiting all the wonderful memorials for our veterans here and share the history of how my husband was named and how um, two very close friends of mine I lost, paying the patriotic freedoms that we take for granted, like freedom of speech, freedom to practice religion. So as I look at the dramatic change that's being discussed with the different religions, I try to think about the safety portion of it. We have certain schools throughout BCPS that on a routine basis, we have a shortage of substitute teachers. A shortage of substitute teachers to just function on the regular day. So for some of these schools that are gonna be impacting with teachers taking off to practice their religion because they have every right to do in this country, we have some safety concerns, and everybody keeps talking about discipline also being a major concern. The kids cannot outnumber the teachers and the educators. So I asked the new calendar committee to probably consider a third option. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Muhammad Jamil. Thank you once again for giving this opportunity. And as I was mentioning how important the education is, many of our children have come before this board and they have pleaded with you at numerous times. They have enumerated the hardships that they face by taking off on their highest holidays. They are stressed out. It is exasperated by their knowledge that they are the ones being singled out, alienated, and marginalized. It is not a numbers game. It is injustice against one child is injustice against all. This breeds contempt and hatred. You are the leaders. It is your duty to find the solution. It is not up to us to give you the solution, even though we did provide to the board about 10 years ago a fair solution for all minorities. Muslims are not against anyone's religion. Please help in stopping the rumors and the propaganda and the politics behind it. I have received many complaints that Muslims are trying to stop the Jewish holidays. Only education, as I was saying before, can enlighten us and everyone else. We only want inclusion and justice. I respect Senator Zarkin. He said, go back to what has been since 1998. What about going back to what existed for decades and decades prior to 1998? That's not the solution. No employer can discriminate against its employees. It begs the question, can you discriminate against your customers? Students are your customers. Are you going to discriminate against them? This is not a simple question. It is a question that requires thought, it requires collaboration, and cannot be decided from one side or the other. It must be decided based on equality, inclusion, and justice. Once the justice is not perceived by the children, my youngest is 40 years old now, and he put through and lived through this perception that he is going to be discriminated. It is you who's teaching that. It's your policies that are enforcing that. These are not good times in our nation. We must eliminate this division, this separation. If we really want to unite, you must do justice. It must be for all. There is a third option. Why don't we have holidays for both? Why only one? Why, why not? 
Is that another solution? You have to take it down. You had the petition from more than 800 who were only from the southern district. There would be many more if they were to be here and present the petition from the western, the northern, northeastern district. So please do the justice. Thank you, Mr. Jamil. Thank you, and God bless you. Our next speaker is Dr. Bosch Farone. calendar committee met in April and in May of this year and voted unanimously to keep the schools open on both Jewish holidays. Members realized that they could not propose closing on the Muslim holidays and Jewish holidays. My colleague in the back, Ms. Lee, said 10% of teachers are Jewish. Where the numbers came from? There is no objective, verifiable support for any number like that. And even if it is true, why the school system has so much Jewish teachers and not Hindus, Sikhs, Muslims, unbelievers, you name it, whichever you know, category it is? Not enough substitutes. The only way, really, the school system would not have enough substitutes if they open on the Jewish holidays is because the school system administration didn't plan for it. You have plenty of time. There is plenty of unemployment in the school system in the county. And to that, I ask you, all the hospitals I work at have a large number of Jewish employees, internists, surgeons, administrators, chiefs of departments. The hospital doesn't get paralyzed on the Jewish holidays. Police department in Baltimore County, Baltimore City does not get paralyzed on the Jewish holidays. Amazon, if it came here, it would not be paralyzed on Jewish holidays. IBM or whichever tier of price that we have in the county would not be paralyzed on the Jewish holidays. Baltimore County government is open on the Jewish holidays. They don't get paralyzed. None of the organizations around us, business or government, behaves like the school system. Why? Imagine the impression about the water. Jewish employees get good water and Muslim employees get less good water. Good meals for Jewish teachers and students and, and bad meals for Muslim uh, students. It is discriminatory for you as Board of Education to close on the Jewish holidays and not to offer equal treatment for the Muslim community. We are asking for inclusion. We want our children to grow up American citizens loving this country and not really feeling marginalized, not feeling left behind. We want you to implement what you talk about when you talk about diversity and inclusion and engagement. We want you to mean it when you say liberty and justice for all. Otherwise, the word all means nothing. It's not really about all. It's a school system that is controlled by one section that has no rationale except bringing in Senator Zirkin and the BJ, BJC director to support their cause. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Verona. Our next speaker is Abby Baton. Good evening again. Good evening. I would like to address the calendar issues that are facing us with the new edict from the governor. <laughs> This year, we will experience the first of the unintended consequences by having a much shorter spring break. Students and staff need spring break for recharging and reinvigorating after the long stretch from January to March. We will see fatigue set in for both adults and children in the, sy in the system, and frankly, I'm concerned about what the spring will be like in BCPS, especially if we have a bad winter. We as a system are forced by the governor to, conf to conform to a one-size-fits-all schedule. That decision is currently out of our hands. 
However, the Jewish holiday closing dates are not. This is not a decision because it is a Jewish holiday or any other person's holiday, but because of the safety for the schools. I have been around longer than almost all of our current school board members. And I remember when our Jewish teachers had to find substitutes for their classes during the spring of the, the previous school year because there weren't enough substitutes to go around. Teachers and students are going to take this time regardless. Many schools will struggle to actually educate when that happens, and this is not the way it should be. Herding our children into uh, the cafeteria to watch a movie because there aren't enough bodies in the school to, to be there for them is not what we should be doing. Our concern is not only for the safety of our students, but for the missed learning opportunities for all. Without enough teachers to go around, schools end up watching children instead of educating them. Those two days become missed days for their curriculum to move forward. The unintended consequences for this change could be felt by all students in the system. It is not in the best interest of our students, staff, and the system to remain open for those holidays. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sharon Saroff. Good evening. Good evening. I am not from Baltimore County. I am from New York. I'm from a part of New York that was predominantly Jewish. So I was afforded the opportunity of having my holidays off no matter what. I worked, when I came to Baltimore, I worked for the city for a year. I worked for the county for a year. The city does not give the Jewish holidays off. And I can tell you that I felt the sting of anti-Semitism when I took my holidays off. And that's not the first time I felt anti-Semitism, but I took my holidays off anyway. And if I worked in this system, I would continue. And I can tell you that the importance of that holiday requires that we take it off. This is not about the equality of different religions. I'm a big advocate of the Muslims getting their holidays off too, because I think that's fair and equal. But what I am concerned about also is how we are working the calendar. We started after Labor Day in New York, and we finished around the 15th of June. We had Jewish holidays off. We had three days for Jewish holidays off, not two. We had Columbus Day, we had Veterans Day off, and we had a week in December, a week in February, and a week in the spring in, around Easter. We didn't have inclement weather days, and we certainly have a lot more up there than you guys do down here. That's why we had a February break. There is a third option. We ought to consider it. But we also ought to keep the Jewish holidays in that calendar. I think we ought to take a look at, before we make a decision of any kind, do it an educated decision. Look and see how many of those teachers are indeed Jewish how many students are indeed Jewish, and do the same for the Muslims. That's how we get equality in the school system. Next on our agenda this evening is public comment on school climate, behavior, and discipline. And as an introduction to uh, that topic, I ask our uh, chair of our uh, PRC <laughs> Policy Review Committee, Mr. Virch, to speak. Uh, very briefly, um, tonight's uh, public hearing is really not an original idea of the um, 
Policy Review Committee. It was actually uh, an idea of a BCPS parent uh, who had contacted me about meeting and over coffee at a Dunkin' Donuts on Taylor Avenue in Parkville, she shared with me um, uh, her story and the story of her, ch of her, her student, her, her child at a middle school. And she said, you know, it's good that I'm able to sit and talk with you about this, but I believe there are other parents just like, uh, like me. And their families have their own stories about their students that attend BCPS schools. And these stories are also about the topics of behavior and climate and discipline. And uh, she said there ought to be a day when they can come and uh, address the board in a public hearing. And listening to what she had to say, I said, well, I'll talk to some of our board members. It found its way onto a retreat agenda for the board. And when um, uh, policies related to discipline and behavior came before the Policy Review Committee, <coughs> I shared with the chair, Romaine Williams, um, Angie Thuman's idea, which was that there would be a public hearing where parents uh, could come and other folks could come because our BCPS families aren't just families that have students in our schools, although there's lots of them, but also uh, our BCS families include our staff. And some of our board members might remember when some of our staff came and brought signs with them to highlight the importance of this particular topic. And then, of course, there are the parents, there are the families that are in both groups. Uh, they're both staff members, and they also have kids. So um, I was able to talk to Romaine, and the board uh, members on the committee of the PRC said that as, a, as part of the, the advisory recommendation to the board regarding these policies, that a public hearing be held. So here we are tonight. I know that uh, I'm eager to hear what uh, uh, our BCPS families, our stakeholders have to say. And uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for that introduction. And I thank Angie, Th Angie Thuman for her, for her idea. People on this board do listen to what parents have to say. Thanks. Very good. Our first speaker on school climate behavior and discipline is Diana Bergman. Hi again. And I want to say a special thank you to Angie. She's a friend of mine on social media. And I am so excited that this day has come. Yay, Angie. OK, so discipline is a very tricky topic to discuss because it's complicated. Reason why discipline is complicated because there's different areas that you would address differently. Discipline is not a cookie cutter, one size fits all. You could have, for example, a student with a language barrier because of the lack of being able to communicate in their native language, um, have a kind of like a, a scared reaction and go into a defense mode. I've seen a child as young as kindergarten once freak out at one of our teachers um, because of that language barrier. And I was able to come into the situation when I was a BCPS interpreter. And the minute I walked into the room and the child understood I could speak the native language, that child was relief. It was no longer a child that was scared or aggressive. I have a child that used to be a nonverbal child. They expressed themselves very different. The supports that we provided for my son that's now 50% intelligible to be able to communicate his wants and needs are very different from a child, for example, that might need a discipline behavior support because there is no parent at home, there is no anchor at home. I talked earlier, the importance of that nutritional value going into the body of a child that will impact their behavior. Same thing when this child at home doesn't have that anchor. And if our schools that have a lot of children and a great deal of the population doesn't have that anchor at home, and there's no anchor at home and no anchor at the school itself because they don't have enough supports, you have chaos. And what's interesting about chaos is when you have chaos, guess what? A teacher cannot teach in chaos. When you have chaos, a student cannot learn in chaos, and nobody moves forward. 
So as you're looking at these different disciplinary actions, please consider, I keep hearing equity. I believe there's um, an equity department. I don't see that department communicating with our board certified behavior analysts. They're the experts in analyzing behaviors, reducing behaviors. They hold a secret key to the discipline matter. Let's get some of our skills specialist people communicating with each other, working together with their strong strengths to come up with the supports and services our children need to learn and our Thank you. Our next speaker is Steve McIntyre. Thank you very much for uh, hosting this, this forum. Um, I wanted to comment about a buzzword that uh, has been infusing discussions of disciplinary policies, uh, and that is racial equity. Um, it's a completely agreeable sounding concept. Uh, but I think it masks some deeply harmful ideas. Uh, I've attached a case study uh, that hopefully was distributed from the Manhattan Institute about the experience of St. Paul, Minnesota in fully implementing this program. Um, in four years, uh, they, they created an environment of anarchy. Teachers were beaten, sent to the hospital. Test scores declined precipitously. Uh, the school board, which was elected, was fired. Uh, and then the superintendent after four years, but by that point, undoubtedly, many kids' futures were ruined, um, and thousands of parents fled the school system, which exacerbated the problems of concentrated poverty and segregation uh, that we're all trying to solve. Um, so I have a few requests for the board, which is, first, do not create bureaucratic obstacles to maintaining order in the classroom. Um, you know, I echo Tabco's suggestion that the, the guidebook not be overly prescriptive. Uh, we have to have confidence in our uh, school-based personnel, you know, who are closest to the issues at hand. Um, don't create obstacles to disciplining chronically disruptive or violent kids. It doesn't help them. They need the message uh, that when they harm their classmates, there are consequences. And it certainly doesn't help, you know, the kids who are being victimized uh, by this, these behaviors. Secondly, um, I'd say to the extent that the county has implemented policies based on the Obama administration's 2014 Dear Colleague letter, uh, that you reconsider them and do so with a skeptical eye. Uh, that guidance has no legal authority. It's not based on science or reason, but a dishonest, toxic ideology. And to the extent anyone in the Department of Education objects to Baltimore County's policies, you should fight them and do so in the most public way possible. Parents, teachers, and the public will support your reasonable policies. Truth and justice is on your side. I say racial equity is a dishonest, toxic ideology because it takes a fact, disparate rate of school discipline, and then deliberately denies obvious explanations such as family structure, socioeconomic conditions, in favor of a predetermined conclusion of discrimination. It does not seek equal treatment for all students. It seeks equal outcomes. And the only way this can be achieved is by reducing discipline or creating different disciplinary standards based on race, a truly noxious and unjust concept. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nicole Palmer. Thank you for having me. Um, I just wanted to talk about the disciplinary. Um, from my standpoint, I have my son who has had some experiences in middle school and elementary school. Um, the problem that I've experienced was when the child he um, has had issues with the school will handle it, but then it stems back to the parents. 
so I feel like a lot of times, not necessarily the school, but like a lot of people have been touching on, sorry, I'm really nervous. Um, a lot of people have been touching on that it's not just the school, but the school, I feel like Baltimore County Public Schools need to also get the parents more involved. Um, hold them more accountable as well. Um, that the children, um, they do need to know right from wrong. They do know right from wrong, obviously, and um, just be taught that better. The bus situations, they are a little out of control. Um, there is no discipline on them. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Our next speaker is Robert Hartlove. He may have left. Mr. Hartlove? I'm going to wait and see. We'll uh, go to the next one if Mr. Hartlove is in the other room, and we'll just put him in a, another slot here. Uh, Cindy Sexton. Thank you. Good evening. As a school librarian, TEPCO board member, and mom of two BCPS graduates, I interact with teachers, paraeducators, additional adult support, staff, parents, community members, and administrators. And I hear time and time again about the issues and problems of discipline in our school. Everyone has a story to tell, a problem, or more accurately, multiple problems they have faced, and a bemoaning of the lack of appropriate consequences and follow through. The tales that are shared with me transcend grade level, race, socioeconomic factors, school location, and every other factor that often affects education. Our school system employees and our parents and communities are frustrated. We frequently hear that while there are discipline plans in place and a BCPS student behavior handbook with consequences, there's a lack of following the parameters, a lack of follow through by administrators and or teachers, and a general lack of consequences for students. I am one of the co-chairs of the TABCO Discipline Action Working Group, affectionately called DOG, working to address some of these issues. We have met with BCPS officials so that we can collaborate and find viable solutions that meet the needs of as many of our population as possible. To that end, the solution needs to be a broad and overarching policy. It must be well thought out, collaboratively developed, and work to teach our students the how and why about behavior expectations and not just give a reward or a punishment. We cannot have a prescriptive policy dealt by this board. It simply does not serve the needs of our students or our teachers and staff. I'm respectfully asking this board to continue to allow TABCO and DOG to work with BCPS to create this policy. We all want what is best for students. Please give us the time so that we can get this policy done right. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Abby Baton. And good evening once again. Good evening. So school climate has been an issue for as long as I can remember, and I'm not going to just address this as a discipline issue. The workload for our teachers, which has increased steadily over the years, is problematic. Much of the increase which has come down on our staff is directly traceable to ed edicts from the state and federal governments. These generally require hardworking educators to prove that we are indeed teaching our students. Therein lies the difficulty. Teachers feel they are not trusted to do what is right without draconian measurement systems put in place. Teachers, the real education experts, always willing to learn from others, always working tirelessly to improve their craft, are the last to be consulted on these new and often pedagogically inappropriate drains on our valuable time and energy. 
As an early childhood, ed childhood educator, we are not able to spend the time and teach our youngest students how to get along, which in turn adds to the discipline issues we are now facing. The best remedy is for our teachers to have help by the way of extra hands. Ours is one of the few professions who don't have consistent assistance with the work. Our expertise should be spent planning lessons, collaborating with other teachers, conferring with parents and other experts to move our work forward. We need more paraeducators and more well-trained, properly paid adult, uh, additional adult assistance in our system. You can't keep just loading up our plates without giving educators enough help or taking something off our PAC schedules. Let's work together to get the resources we need to properly staff our schools so our students can get the attention they need to learn and also to learn how to get along with one another. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sharon Saroff. I'm speaking to you tonight as a parent of a child who used to be a behavior problem and of an ad, as an advocate who gets inundated by her clients concerning the lack of appropriate response by administrators concerning discipline problems. Just today, I received a phone call from a client telling me that her son had ripped up a classroom, kicked the teacher, he was not sent to the focus room, he was not given a suspension, he was allowed to come back to school to, today. The very next day, what does that tell him? The school is afraid to admit that they don't have the supports to address this child's needs. So they're simply not doing anything about it. And this is not one school. This is many schools, because I'm getting this from many parents. Also, when an incident occurs, you're required by law to document that incident, especially if you contact a parent and say to the parent, please come get your child before the end of the day. That's called a suspension. Whether you like it or not, it's a suspension because that child is asked to leave the building. You better document that and you better address it and there is a lack of documentation of these incidents to the point where a court order can't even get them because they don't exist. The way you address discipline is consistency, communication, support for your teachers, enough assistance in the classroom. I'm sorry, I can't teach in a classroom of 35, 40 kids. But that's what a lot of teachers are expected to do nowadays. You lower the ratio of student to teacher, you put enough supports in those classrooms, you follow those IEPs with fidelity, and you document things and that discipline's gonna go down. You have to address it appropriately. Thank you. Our next speaker is Eric Edwards. All right. Thank you for giving me the opportunity again. Um, We've already spoken. It sounds like you know a lot of folks have, have echoed the the notion that uh, resources uh, an increase in resources is definitely needed. And um, prior, you know, previously I made mention about 
with regard to behavior, you know, we're looking at a lot of the consequences versus looking at kind of the causes, some of the issues that may be underlying that may not be as, as easily seen as something happens, then you take action. So, I mean, you know, with looking at those resources and increasing the opportunities for well, as far as with, uh, because I had a story as well with regard to my daughter, I'll just say this um, situation where my daughter had witnessed a child being bullied in the lunchroom and had seen it happen. The kid, uh, the young man didn't say anything, you know, out of embarrassment, um, my daughter assumed. So she stood up for him on his behalf, went to tell a teacher, told that teacher, and what happened? Nothing. The teacher said nothing, documented nothing. Instead, my daughter was frustrated, came home, talked to me. I said, we need to talk to somebody else. I need you to go and speak to either a vice principal or your counselor and maybe get some guidance, you know, let them know what's going on. So in the course of her sharing that information, she shared it. The educator said, well, you know, it could be, you know, I see your point and I see what the teacher might have thought. She probably thought blah, 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 blah. I mean, needless to say, what ended up happening as a result, my daughter was just placed on an anti-bullying conference. She was, um, you know, actually invited to go to, to, to speak on this, which is one thing, but then what about the kid that was bullied? What about the child that did the bullying? What happens? So what I, you know, what I'm really proposing with the resources that we're talking about increasing if anything, we're looking at perhaps maybe just developing an interprofessional team that would consist not only of the teachers, paraeducators, and administrators within the school, but I'm, I'm really curious to know what the student, you know, what the school nurses are doing as far as maybe, and counselors, what type of education are they receiving about maybe how kids are responding in this information age, how they're responding with a stress level that is way more than you and I had even experienced. I mean, all of us have experienced stress, Many of us have, have kids, so we see the stress that they're dealing with way different than what we had deal, dealt with. The pressures of, of excelling and trying to do better um, you know, academically and in other aspects. They're doing so many other extracurricular activities. There's so much going on, but the focus is still perhaps being lost on what's going on in these kids' minds. What's going on in our children's minds? And, and really, when I'm going back to those you know, the nurses and, and counselors, as we look to increase the resources, maybe let's focus on educating our administrators and the teachers on identifying exactly what these um, really situations are and how to address them properly. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Edwards, you were the last of the speakers on the school climate, behavior, and discipline matter. The, uh, the board thanks all of you for uh, participating um, in both the uh, calendar uh, public hearing and the school climate behavior and discipline um, public hearing. Um, next on our agenda is item F, new business personnel matters, and for that we invite Dr. Mayo to come forward. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Superintendent White, members of the board. I would like board consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, leaves of absence, and certificated appointments. I have a motion to approve personnel matters as presented in exhibits F1 through F4. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mayo. Uh, next on our agenda, item G, is um, action taken in closed session, and I invite um, Mr. Nussbaum to come forward. Thank you. Good evening. Earlier this evening, the board considered an appeal regarding a confidential student matter in your quasi-judicial capacity. This matter was considered on the record as there was no request made for oral argument. At this time, it would be appropriate to confirm the action that was taken in that case in closed session in that matter, which was hearing examiner number 18-11. Do I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session? So moved. Second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. Thank you, and the order's on the table. Thank you, Mr. Nussbaum. Next on our agenda, I think we're going to contract, but Mr. Stewart just stepped out, so. Um, um, 
I could present the contract. Very good. <laughs> uh, we met earlier this evening and re uh, reviewed as a committee uh, items H1 through H10 and are forwarding all items to the full board for approval. Mr. Stewart, he stole your thunder. That's uh, <laughs> All right. <laughs> Mr. McDaniel's motion doesn't need a second. Uh, any discussion on contract items H1 through H10? Uh, if not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Let's see. Um, the uh, next item on our agenda is item I, an information item only, and that is that the 2017 pupil yield study um, is uh, uh, in your materials for your review. Um, I don't think we have any presentation on that, right? Okay. Um, and uh, that brings us to announcements. Uh, school is closed for students on Friday, October 20th for a statewide professional development day. And our next board meeting is Tuesday, October 24, uh, at 6.30 p.m. Is there anything uh, for the good of the order before we adjourn? Policy committee on Monday night. Policy committee on Monday night. Monday afternoon. Monday <laughs> afternoon. When's that sun going down? Yeah. Four o'clock is not <laughs> Any other matters? 4.30. <laughs> We're adjourned.